All right. Well, thank you, Laura. Thank you for to the whole dream team who's organizing these, helping to organize these series this fall, this spring. And I want to thank Rujara and and Claire who are here and all the students. We are thrilled to 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 welcome uh, Chinwei uh, Ekena to give us a talk today. She comes from Nigeria, which I am very proud of as a fellow Nigerian. I was born there myself. And we and she is she is come, she came to the U.S. and studied with Nancy Amato at Texas A&M, and we were just learning that in fact she has now a connection to Berkeley because Nancy went to Berkeley, and Nancy's advisor Franco uh, Preparata was a topologist here at Berkeley, and so he advised Nancy, then moved to Illinois, and Nancy also was advised by Emmanuel Blum for her master's. So a lot of good Berkeley connections here. And so uh, what Chinwei has been focusing on is she has a background in biology and bioinformatics and algorithms related to, to biological systems. And she applied that and during her PhD to the very difficult problem of protein folding, which is a motion planning problem that has been very elusive. In fact, it's very relevant this year with the COVID-19, there was a, a, a very important challenge to understand the structure of the of the COVID-19 virus. So she is she has done work on also applying motion planning to other problems such as UAVs and other systems, all thinking about this in the context of what are the, the, the fundamental mathematical framework that underlies motion planning. So with that, I want to turn the floor over to Chinwei and welcome to Berkeley. Thank you. So um, let me share my screen and then we'll stop. Okay, so I think everybody sees my screen. I have too many screens, so I'm, I want to be sure I'm showing the right screen. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm going to be giving a talk, really talking about like evolving geometric and topology improvements, motion planning. I'm going to just be discussing some of the um, investigations and some new um, research directions. I've been trying to take this topology um, systems in motion planning. Then I'll talk a little bit. I'm not going to go into too much details about the theory. Then I'll look into some applications, then discuss my um, motivation within the bio biology, computational biology framework of things. So I would basically begin by um, giving a little bit about myself. So um, I'm Nigerian. I did my BSc and MSc in Covenant University. And um, the interesting thing about my journey is I started off really as a bioinformatician. I was really looking at this disease, malaria. And so my task for my MSc was basically to come up with a model for predicting 3D structures of proteins. So with that, Nancy came to visit um, in Nigeria and then we had a discussion. And she was like, I should come in for like a summer program, really talking about 3D structures of protein. I really didn't know she had really that much um, research in robotics. So came in, then did a PhD and Nancy went, well, probably let's see if you could do something in robotics. And from robotics, we basically have some kind of parallel research that goes into um, protein folding. And that was how I moved into robotics and I've been there ever since. So I basically jumped into robotics as a case of trying to get 3D structures for proteins. So that's basically was my PhD um, experience. So this image basically is me with Nancy and then all of her students at that time, probably missing one or two. And then from there, I joined um, Yorbani in New York otherwise known as SUNY. And um, there I've, been, I've had some very interesting and wonderful students. And I've been looking into more in-depth topological properties of um, the planning space for motion planning. I've looked a little bit into the notion of uncertainty and path planning, adaptive planning. And also um, I still do computational biology. So um, I also like talking about some service initiatives I'm really involved in. So I'm really involved in STEM and minority um, research with some urban um, high school around me. Then I have an initiative in Africa, but really 
still really looking at um, trying to find a cure for malaria because malaria is a disease that the, um, the parasite that basically causes malaria evolves really rapidly. So there's really no vaccine for malaria. The drugs do not last eternity. The drugs basically need to be um, improved over time. It's not a one fix all issue. So that's just a little bit um, about my journey. So I had this um, video, which I'm sure most of us have already seen. And if you see, let me see if I can have it play. See if I can get it to play, that would be great. For some reason I don't have it playing now. Okay. So <laughs> the reason I have this video was, um, I was basically, I used this for a different talk, but then I felt it was something interesting I was not going to remove for this talk. Everybody must have seen this one way or the other. And uh, we all agree it's interesting, whether in a positive light or not. It's really not part of what I'm going to be discussing, but I felt it was a good um, breaker for what my talk was going to be for. So um, what research I do, so I'm basically a computer scientist, so I delve more towards the software development part of things. I look into algorithms, I look into modeling. I've started looking a little bit into machine learning as well. So, um, and then I'm a motion planner. Most of my work is really based into this notion of motion planning. How you generate a feasible path for a robot to go from location A to B. So in its, in its simple term, it's basically we're looking at the configuration space and then you're looking for how you can plan for and avoid collisions within that space and then be able to return a final roadmap that represents the free space. So um, that in a nutshell is basically where my um, research interest falls. So looking a little bit into um, roadmap, this is going to really lead into me beginning to define what I mean by topological maps. So we have a roadmap definition. We all know we have this graph with n vertices. And then each vertex basically represents some valid configuration. And then in this valid roadmap, each edge is associated with some path that connects two vertices, such that a connection is typically a short path connecting through the configuration space. And then we say that a roadmap is a graph of valid motions of a robotic system. So the next question that comes into play is, so what are on um, topology maps? So in trying to define, there's really no um, hard and fast definition of topological maps, but in trying to have some good um, definition of topological maps, I kept coming across a lot of work by Harry Chosen. He, he's done like tremendous work in um, topology. And so that was where I got some definitions. I now stay working with to us, trying to see, um, make some contributions in those different um, sectors. So, um, one definition I found interesting it says that for each homotopy class in a free space, there's a corresponding homotopy class in our roadmap. So what that means basically that if there's a loop in a free space, then there should be a loop represented in my roadmap. So some properties um, basically to consider is how we can provide a qualitative description of our paths, how we can also segment and catalog the free space then be able to perform some region identification and decomposition of the space and be able to also return diverse set of paths. To be able to return diverse set of paths, it becomes obvious if you now begin to think about route planning for like your self-driving cars and um, UAV route planning for different locations if you're having occlusions or weather. So returning diverse sets of paths is um, also very important. Then, one definition says that a bad topological map would be if you find yourself returning redundant homotopic classes in that map. So basically you have maps that basically could deform to itself. So you're basically just returning the same thing and basically don't need to have so much information. That's a bad topological map. So um, talking about topology would lead us definitely to begin to look at this notion of the medial axis and the generalized Voronoi diagram. So um, what are basically 
some high level definitions of our media access. So we're looking at the closure of a set of points closest to any obstacle with equidistant properties. That's, and then it's able to capture the features of the free space. So you have this deformation retraction onto the free space. So those are notions we begin to think about when we're talking about the GVD and the medial axis. And then we begin to also think about this Delonai complex, which is basically used to decompose the space into cells. But then we know there are some limitations. There's always that limitations on it being able to work in this um, 3D Euclidean space. And then in some cases, you find that your medial axis might not be connected. That's when you look at the roadmap. So what I now really start looking at is um, what I was really interested in is how can I say I can build a topological map that would be pretty quick to, um, to build and also work in high dimension. That's a tall order. And um, that led me really to begin to look at this notion of topological data analysis methods that actually exist and trying to see if there are theorems or proofs that says that we could actually use some of these existing methods, which we've not tried so far, basically to test on our um, configuration space to be able to generate some roadmap. So um, that brought, us to, brought me to the notion of simplices, where I'm now saying, okay, a C-space could consist of topological features that can be defined via different mathematical concepts. So I'm looking at simplices where I'm saying my um, zero simplices would represent nodes in the environment. One simplices will be edges, two simplices will be planes as we move on. But, and then it's also stated that these features could help us support continuity, connectivity, and convergence in the space. So there are various um, TDA methods, which includes the VR complex, Victoria Rips complex, otherwise, um, I think along the line, we've been calling them Rips complex, the Czech complex, the Alpha complex, and many more. So if you're familiar with some of these um, complexes, we know that they are very notorious in the sense that it could be very expensive to compute. But then they do help us extract the topological features of the C space. So I now, um, really start looking at this groups complex because in the next slide, I'll basically now really now talk about, um, there, was, there was basically a paper that I read which says, if I can show that the Ribs complex is equivalent to the Czech complex, that representation also gives me a topological representation of my space. So Czech complex basically now uses this notion of your abstract simplical complexes, where we now know we're now defining everything almost in an abstract sense that we do not really need to start looking at um, how we embed it into the space. We can go into the, like different dimensions. And then with this one, we're now looking at a case where we're saying the K simplices corresponds to a subset of K plus one points, which, can, which we can actually enclose in a ball radius of T. Or in this case, we look at, um, at alpha. So here I now have a check complex where I have um, it basically enclosed in some balls and I'm able to produce some complex within it. Then um, it says now that the Ribs complex becomes the largest simplical complex sharing the same one skeleton with a check complex. And then this can actually become easier to, to compute when we consider several properties. So before I go into these properties, I wanted to talk about a case where um, some people actually saw where they computed the VR complex explicitly. And then the whole aim was basic, basically to see if they could capture the topology and also build some parts on a 2D space. So that was what um, the aim of that particular work was. So if you really look at, um, for some reason I don't have my mouse. But then if you, if you basically look at my third image, now you begin to see that if we say we want to the, actually um, produce our VR complex, it's going to really explode as the space basically increases. So that's one of the issues with explicitly defining your VR complex. 
But then I read this um, paper, which says the Victorian Drift Complex also provides topological correct reconstructions of sampled parts. And then what this paper was basically saying is, there could be ways you could basically um, build your ribs complex, almost like what they call a witness complex. And if you satisfy certain conditions, that complex will be equivalent to your check complex. And your check complex is known to basically capture the topology of the space, even though it's known that your VR complex does not. But they're saying that under certain conditions, you can actually have your check complex and your um, VR complex equivalent. So that was the um, idea I was basically running with. So to be able to do that in um, a high level description of what we were able to do or take away from this paper was we're like, the first thing you need to do is we need to build a dense map. So this dense map in our case was a case, if you, if you think about we motion planners and configuration space, we kept on training samples into the space. But then it could also be a situation where you have a point cloud or you could have some sensor information. So I built in a dense map until some sampling conditions are actually met. Then I perform a collapse. So if you're thinking about collapse, you now begin to think about things like your maximal click, which in itself is also expensive. But they also talked about what you call the notion of your extended collapse, which is basically what um, we looked into implementing. Then the resulting map would capture the topology of the free space. And then from there, we now generate a path for our robot. So what are some of these um, conditions? What we got here is um, a ribs complex graph that is homotopically equivalent to an N offset of the sampling space X. So we're now say looking at these three um, constants, epsilon, alpha, and beta. And then the notion is that there are non-negative real numbers such that alpha is less than or equal to B. These are basically conditions we got from that particular paper. And then the N offset is equal to two alpha minus some value N beta minus two E greater than zero. So what this really means is we're saying that P, P is basically the sample finish set of points we're going to now produce in our environment. And then the head of distance to a compact subset is epsilon or less. So what we're really looking at is we kept building our dense map until we satisfied that property of epsilon. Then once we're able to do that, we now, and then we do a collapse, our resulting map will become homotopy equivalent to the N offset of X, which is also equivalent to our chef complex, which eventually gives us this topological representation. So in a simple form, this is basically what we're trying to do. So we're looking at a case where um, the number of nodes, we are looking at our n number of nodes having this relationship of square root of two over n all over n plus one. So those are basically values or conditions we're trying to get to, be, to say, okay, we have enough samples in the environment and then we can now do our collapse to get that representation of the free space, which is the goal that we're trying to make. So if we're able to achieve this, then, um, and then we do our collapse. What I have here basically is, I was now trying to look at how this looks in comparison to your mural axis sampling, your uniform sampling, your obstacle-based sampling, and then what else actually looks like. So this is like on a 2D very simple um, representation. So uniform sampling, we know how uniform sampling behaves. And this is our mural axis sampling, which is equidistant basically, um, to the obstacles. Then our obstacle-based sampling, basically you retract from, you create um, a node in the obstacle space and then you basically create an array onto the, until you get to a free space. Then you find yourself building um, nodes around basically your obstacles. Then for our approach, it gave us some very interesting um, representation, which, because I would really be interested in comparing that with what I have in my medial axis. So what we got basically is some representation of the shape of the free space in this case. And this gave us, this shows really that using those conditions, 
we were able to actually get a representation of the free space. So that was, this was basically um, a very early check or science check to see if we were going in the right direction. So what happened after that now is an extension. When I say thinking of, now I can say I have representation of the free space and it goes beyond just your 2D, 3D dimensions. Can I get some interesting things out of this free space information I now have? So that led me really looking into this notion of critical points because I'm now trying to see if there are ways I can get landmarks in the environment of the environment. So that's where the whole notion of critical points now came. And then to be able to get critical points, I now started um, looking into this notion of the discrete mass theory. So the discrete mass theory basically, I'm now looking at can I apply the discrete mass theory to this simplicial complex viewed from our sample C space? And then our, the algorithm I built basically leverages advantages provided by our discrete mass theory, looking at some density based functions to detect the critical spot points on the boundaries of the obstacles. And then to be able to do that, I'm now looking at generating configurations near the C space coverture with some clearance. We need to look into um, that a little bit, probably in the next slide. So the discrete mass theory basically, just to give you a brief about um, discrete mass theory, it shows the relationship between some real valid function over the simplicial complex, which is in this case our ribs complex. And then this function basically describes the connectedness of the complex from the point where the function gradient vanishes, which is also called a critical point. So you can start thinking about it from the notion of your minima, your maxima, or your um, saddle points. So how we define our discrete mass theory is we're looking at let F be a discrete mass function when restricted to vertices on our ribs complex. So it becomes dependent on both the, dis, um, the product of both the distance and the density functions for point X in our C space. So what exactly were we trying to do with this um, discrete mass theory and the critical points? So the ribs complex, the map actually affords us the ability to retrieve more interesting properties of the C space. So the theory we're looking at for F is, as I said, is based on the, dis um, the distance and also the density. So this distance could be some Euclidean distance function, which measures the distance between points in the free space and the nearest point Y on the obstacle space. So that was basically now looking at some minimum representation of what we have in the free space. And then we now looked at the density function, basically, which is now the point, <coughs> density function being density, um, and Y is basically the point on the obstacle. So the function density counts all the neighbors in C3 close to Y within some distance. So with that information, we were now able basically to now capture the critical points from our ribs complex. And then the critical points are incident on the obstacle space. Then the next thing we just did is basically to retract it basically to the convex hall and onto the free space. So that's if we want it, if we want to use those critical points as things like your landmarks or your waypoints. So now that we've been able to get the um, critical point, I now really said looking at its critical points would give me some information about certain regions in the space because if I have my critical point at different obstacles in the space, this was just something I was um, thinking aloud and really interacting with um, a mathematician in my, in my university. And we're like, if we have this critical point, it would actually, because now I have a ribs complex that gives me some topological representation of my free space. So if I have this critical point incident on the different obstacles in my, um, in my environment, it should be able to give me some region almost like some implicit region decomposition of my space. Because each critical point would represent different sections of my obstacle and then give me different region representations on the space. So with that information, I was like, we could actually use the information about the critical points 
should be able to generate or return diverse paths. So that led us basically to this algorithm where the first thing we're doing is we have this dense graph, which is the first thing we do to get our rich complex. And then we're basically trying to solve a query from start to go. And I'm trying to get some end distinct, distinct paths from that start to go. So the first thing I do is I construct my complex, as I said, then I do my collapse. Then I identify my critical points. So after I identify my critical points, for every, um, what we did at that point is for every path we generated, we're able to identify the critical, critical points that basically incident on those paths. So in that way, we're able to, we use the critical point basically almost as a number system for paths. So every path that is incident on this critical point, we, right now we haven't proven it yet, but we say all of these paths basically belong to the same class. So if we have like 10 critical points, every path that returns uh, and says it passed through critical points one, three, and five, all of them are basically grouped into one class. So that's basically um, on a high level what we were able to achieve. So I now started running some um, experiments. So we looked at this, the reason I had this 3D closer environment was I, I thought it was going to be able to produce different points, different critical points. Therefore, it was going to give me like a lot of like interesting information. So it's just a very simple um, toy environment. Then I had this six DOF house um, environment, and then I had this Kukagi bot eight DOF environment. So it returns different paths. And then we had this path length threshold. So basically I, we had the path length threshold because it was going to return, we're going to have a lot of paths being returned. But I was trying to compare it with this VOS method. Um, I didn't talk a little a much about the VOS method, but VOS method is also another method which we found was looking at diverse paths. So that was basically um, what we were able to do. So we realized, yes, we could have um, diverse paths. They are in different um, classes. Not, we've, at this point, we haven't like given a strong proof that they're actually of different homotopy classes, but it's beginning to be inferred that we can actually state that, that they are different um, homotopy classes. So we now say looking at also the computation time it takes, still comparing with that method. And what we did at this point is um, to be able to get my dense um, map, I could use any existing sampling method. So I looked at the comparison when we use uniform, when we use Gaussian, when we use bridge test. So, um, and that was what we did comparing in these three environments. And then we basically saw that in terms of time for the Kuka Yibot, we didn't get the VOS method basically to complete. That's the method basically filled in the HD of environment. But then in the 3D and in the house environment, we could see basically that um, we had some very good comparison of time. And then we shows, okay, the time overhead of using our method is not so bad. Then we have this average path length, which shows also some very um, interesting results. So we could produce um, paths of that. Basically we have paths where the, the average le um, length is actually less than the compared method we're trying to do. So we basically just, all of this are basically just results to see if we're going in the right um, direction. So some of the outcomes of what um, we're trying to look at. So I have this image basically as an example of one, what my um, critical points could look like and basically what the different paths we could generate in this very simple environment could also look like in a bit to see what the different path classes could be. So for like the first example here, it's going to return to me both the paths, the, both the path length and all of the critical points that are incident on it. So in that direction, we could have multiple paths, but then all of those paths basically, if they are returning the same critical point, it would be like all of these paths belong to the same class. And then for the Kuka bot, I just had this, um, very interesting um, result I just wanted to show. 
where we're able to produce four different parts. So these four different parts basically becomes clear to us that in some cases you could see that we have basically two classes where we have the purple and the green, and we also have the red and um, the red and the blue parts. So these are just basically um, some interesting notions of the direction we're trying to go. So some outcomes that I'm really looking at is being able to use these critical points as waypoints of features in our configuration space, and also being able to produce diverse set of paths. Then eventually would help us classify priority regions. Then also really looking at a case of um, reducing replanning due to moving obstacles. So I now start, as I say really looking at this dynamic obstacle because if I'm able to prove that I have this different path, then if I'm having dynamic obstacles where a path becomes invalid, I have different, I have both my critical points which explains to me the features of the free space and alternative paths that we could actually use. So those are the notions that we're basically, um, basically beginning to look at. So with that, that makes me uh, want to like, how do I really define what a topology rich map is? So I'm saying, we say a planning method is topology rich if it captures the connectivity of the sampled space, captures the shape of the obstacles, which includes the existence of holes, captures the shape of the free space, and then provides a bound on the number of samples needed to ensure power generation. So being able to ensure this bound on the number of samples brings us back to those conditions that I was talking about. So extending this current work, I'm beginning to see that um, this work could actually lead to me being able to show that I could actually produce some optimal path planning. So that's the direction um, this work is beginning to go into. And then some incremental, um, some in, I'm supposed to write, some in, in, implement, um, incremental production of the RIPS complex. So at a point now, it's like I'm producing a global map, but I'm looking at a case where I can incrementally build my RIPS complex, even as I'm building my path on my roadmap. And then bound on the samples needed in a given environment, and then extend this to very high articulated linkage robot. If I'm saying it works in high dimensions, those are things I want to be able to effectively show. So, that basically, in a way, concludes what I was talking about in terms of the topology. I'm now trying to, just in a brief few minutes, now really talk about um, one or two places I'm beginning to see myself apply this. So I was looking at this adaptive speed collision for dynamic environment. So this is a case where I can use the information, like my waypoint, to basically see if I can have some, because now I have, I, I, I have features of the space. And those are, that's one of the things we talk about when we think about your slam. So I have features of the space. So I'm now saying, okay, can I do this offline training where I get this topological reach map? Then I now say, okay, next thing I was, the next thing I'm saying now stay playing around is, can we use like a poison parameter to basically say, within discrete events, can I have, can I basically get information about the collision, the collision that occurs at this particular location and at this particular time? So to be able to do that, we simply just train two poison process, both in terms of what happens during collision and the time that happens. So we apply this on um, this very, um, very interesting, crazy call, it's called a crazy fly environment. And the aim was basically to see if I could get a desired trajectory when I'm having moving obstacles in the environment. So that's basically what this looks like. I have a stack, like a mobile robot or a UAV, and then with obstacles constantly moving in the environment, can I get to my goal position? While I'm thinking of things like speed adjust adjustments and also um, changing directions. So what I have here is basically um, some simulation of what we're trying to achieve. The ones in orange basically are the constantly moving obstacles. And then I have a trajectory 
Then I have my robot basically trying to go through that trajectory. And it's going to be reducing its speed when it encounters or when there's basically um, a robot incident on it. So this is the result of we using our feature map and also our poison process, which we've trained offline. So the next thing I want to show is, so we tried doing this on like a real, we had this crazy fly um, robot with, had like multiple different ones, but here we have us with two obstacles. So the obstacles are the ones producing this red trajectory. And then my host is basically the one in the yellow trajectory. So this gives you an idea of what we're basically trying to achieve. So the interesting thing about this is Initially, what we're aiming is, we're going to have, this particular test was very interesting. We're going to have our two optical drones, basically just form an eight on both sides. But then it basically, one of the drone was basically going out of, um, but then my host drone was still able to like reduce speed and change direction as need be. So that's basically give us some very, um, interesting notion as to how well our method is performing and adapting. So we had success in collision avoidance. We're able to do some kind of automated speed reduction and we're able to also get to the node. And then those are basically the, um, what we have for our crazy fly drone. So that really um, is what we've been able to achieve and what I was planning to present. So in a nutshell, basically really on the robotic side of things is I'm really interested in cluttered and dynamic environments. So to be able to achieve that, I need to be able to have a rich um, representation of my space, which is what I'm trying to achieve. So I basically just put this up because I'm like in structured and known environments, it could be pretty easy to basically get um, this mobile robot, which is already currently being done, but then bring in clutteredness, bringing dynamic, bringing people moving around in an effort setting. And then you begin to have some interesting things happening. How would you adjust the speed of the robot? How would you be able to plan ahead of time for um, constantly moving obstacles, which could be humans in the environment or falling boxes in like a warehouse? So those are things I'm really interested in. And those are the types of robots I'm really interested in playing around with. So that somewhat concludes my talk in terms of robotics. So I'm just going to give a brief about, um, right, I think two or three slides about motion panel and molecular motion, which um, most of us would be aware of. So if we're looking at robot motion, we're looking at validity, we were trying to get a collision free environment. So protein folding, Validity is really just, we're looking at low energy regions. And then in protein folding, we're looking at our start positions being basically just the set of sequences all stretched out. While our goal position is going to be the 3D structure with a low energy representation. So one interesting thing um, which we've been able to do, both when I was doing my PhD with Nancy, has been the fact that the same, it's basically the same code we use for our motion planning. It's basically the same code we use for our protein folding. The only difference was on the inputs and basically what our notion of collision is. So it's important basically to study these pathways because it gives us an insight into protein interaction and the function, which could lead to better structure prediction algorithms. Because if you, to be able to get the function of a protein, you need, to, you need to understand the structure of the protein. And then computational approaches, and then it also helps us with diseases such as Alzheimer's and Marcow diseases because this, these diseases have been known to be caused by misfolded proteins. So if we're able to understand the folding process, or if we're able to compute the folding process, basically helps biologists in terms of them being able to achieve um, and understand the disease to get drugs that are necessary for these diseases. So the computational approaches are important because it's hard to study this folding process experimentally. And then 
you might need to study 44 thousands of already solved structures because what ends up happening is you have this set of target um, proteins. You need to study the structure for every protein as a potential drug target against the proteins or probably if you're looking at the proteins in a particular parasite. You need to study that against all the proteins in a particular in a human, if the human is the host. So it could be very expensive if you're going to do that experimentally in the lab. So it does help guide design future experiments. So um, that's my brief really into um, what I want to talk about protein folding. But then currently what I've started really looking at is, I'm going back to now what I started doing before I started my PhD, which is I'm still interested in malaria. I'm still trying to figure out how I now I'm on the other side of things. How can I use my expertise to help in terms of getting this um, a sufficient enough drug for malaria and also be able to understand the need or the, or the direction we can go in terms of getting a vaccine. And then the good thing is I have some very strong collaborators in Africa who have really gone ahead into patenting some drugs. So I have the support to be able to see if we could figure out or get some results to this whole um, issue of malaria because it's a very deadly disease. It has variants even all the way in Thailand. It's a disease, it's the number one leading cause of, of death in third world countries. So in as much as it's not a disease that is very rampant in this part of the world, it's still something that is really an epidemic in continents like Africa. So I'm basically interested in looking at the parasite basically is known as plasmodium. It has what we call like a blood stage. So I'm interested in how the, the genes in this plasmodium is actually expressed. The reason I'm interested in that is if I can understand how the genes are expressed, it gives me an understanding of what proteins we should concentrate on, then eventually what I need to basically do my folding um, implementation on. So that's basically where I'm heading to, being able to use what I have in terms of being able to aid for this malaria. So it's expressed, I'm looking at the enzymes, I'm looking at proteins. Then I did this um, expression where I used an RNA model. And the interesting thing was, I used the RNA model on the time series and got very good predictions, which currently is actually very handy in what they're currently doing in Africa. So with these predictions, I'm now looking at things like how we build a network of the interactions of the proteins, identify unknown 3D structures, which I'm not talking about this in this talk, but I can actually use my TDA approach to actually identify the 3D structures and some features of the protein. Then perform some protein folding analysis, which brings me back to my expertise and what I'm able to do. And then eventually actually make some contribution towards the ongoing research in my area. So I think with that, I think I'm going to end my talk here and then hopefully take some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Chinmay. That you. was a beautiful talk. Very beautiful. Yes, thank you, Chen Wei. Actually, if you can unshare your screen, then we can um, we can maybe ask you a few. I, I do have a few questions on. Um, it's 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 a little bit of a um, a step back, which is, I mean, thinking about the, one of the things that's been so much in the news recently was Alpha Fold, and mm -hmm. the progress that they claim around. I mean, some of the reports were that AlphaFold had solved this this problem, and the people I talked to who know who work in this area, like you, pretty much had said no. That's not. It was. It would solve some subclass. Um, I'm just curious what your perspective is on 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 AlphaFold and its potential. I think the AlphaFold is a very strong um, middle research direction towards this folding protein folding problem. The reason I say that is. Due to the fact that they are using very strong and very um, powerful machines, they're able to fold proteins of 
higher dimension than what we've been doing in our normal research. But then there are still some very important proteins we've not been able to solve. Like there are proteins that are complexes where you have three, four different proteins all cut out together. They've not been able to solve that. And that's very important. Or very tiny proteins where it's very difficult to really fold them. Those are things they've, they've not really been able to achieve. But they've been able to achieve like the broad spectrum of high dimensions, give me, so, give me a protein, and with enough computational power, I'll be able to get something. But they are still very interesting proteins, like even ligands that they've not been able to really do. That's really my view on that. OK, OK. So they've sort of picked a niche that they were able to work yeah. well in. But that doesn't mean they've solved the whole problem. There's many other aspects of this, just like in motion planning, right? I mean, you have something very analogous. You have systems that work very well for certain subclasses of problems, mm -hmm. but they don't solve other classes of problems. Yes. Okay. Think. Okay. That's helpful because I think it's there's been a little misrepresentation, or at least you know, a hype in the uh, in the news. Not sure it's their fault, but it just is a it's the way you know the news cycle runs. Okay. Um, other questions from others. I maybe have a more um, kind of a high level question about, um, so, so the mathematical methods that you're presenting for use in robot motion planning, um, it makes sense to me that you, to, to model the system in this way and to use these definitions. And I'm, I'm interested in your thoughts about, because um, you know, there's a lot of work in robot motion planning, which is not so principled. And it's sort of like developing algorithms that are not necessarily so mathematically well-founded. Mm -hmm. And so maybe my question is more of a philosophical one about, um, could you give us, um, or could you perhaps talk a little bit about how, um, you know, this balance between kind mm -hmm. of, you know, the, the, the principled mathematical methods that you're developing and the, you know, understanding, for example, the topology and the homotopy, the homotopy classes yeah. um, related to sort of, you know, just sort of fast and quick greedy algorithms for doing robot motion planning. What, what, how, you know, maybe for the students in the audience too, what's the, the kind of, um, what's a, a sort of balance there? We need um, both, maybe, or, you know, what do you think? Both, but then one concern I've been having is really, there's so much out there in terms of research, but then why haven't, why haven't we been able to equate that towards real world applications? And I think the reason why that hasn't happened is because the mathematics behind it feels when we begin to run into like different dimensions or into like, we have, okay, we have this part, we bring in trajectory, we bring in constraints, then it begins to fail. So my view really, the reason why I really went back to the mathematics of it is I want to be sure, I want to understand if it's a complex problem, are there, are there mathematical foundations that show that we could do it quicker, but then still accurate? If we make, if we do all of that rigor of getting something accurate and also quicker, can we eventually have something that will be actually usable? I'm really interested in being able to have motion planners that are really usable and okay, it's, I don't know if it's a high, plan or something. But then eventually, like the self-driving cars, motion planning, they don't go back to saying, oh, well, we'll do it in 2D space. We just run it on the grid days and then we're done. We actually yeah. say, OK, it's not that expensive to spend some time doing some offline planning with a topologically rich representation of the space. So that's really my motivation is to say, OK, I have something that would work if you, since you have all this um, interesting high performance computing. If you can do this, then you're going to end up having something even more accurate than what you currently have. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. That's a great, that's a nice perspective. Thank you. Mm. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks for asking that, Claire, because I think that you're right. There's this, this idea of sampling based methods that have 
a little bit of the flavor of, uh, in a sense of deep learning, I would say, in that uh, they work, they, they've worked very well in practice, but they are, it's hard to get guarantees. Mm -hmm. And the idea that Jinwei is talking about, about finding the topological waypoints, you know, actually identifying them and using Morse theory, I think it's really interesting because, Jinwei, and I have to, I'm sorry, I have to go to my lab meeting in a few minutes, but um, one, one thing I'm curious about is how you might combine those two. Um, in other words, if you find the waypoints that can you use those with other sampling based approaches? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So you have, you, you have explored. So, so the idea is that it sort of seeds the sampling based approaches with, so it is kind of a hybrid that Claire's talking about. And I think that's where there's really some potential, right? Because you have to find these critical points. You can't just randomly sample and hope to find them. You actually want to compute them yes. and then use them. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Okay. Well, I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to dash off, but I wanna I wanna just thank you again, Chinwei, for for your for being here today, for sharing your ideas and your inspiration about malaria is so relevant and timely. I'm really excited by that because I think, you know, I know that's the next big frontier. There's a lot of hope now with the advances that have happened over the last year, triggered by by COVID-19, that the that malaria is next, that there could be a major breakthrough and that messenger RNAs and other approaches might pro might work there. Mm -hmm. So I'm um, really excited about that, and I'm looking forward to, to your next talk when you tell us more about when you make the advances there, because that's the kind of that's the kind of change that really can change the world. I mean, you you can you can save millions of lives, um, so that's totally inspiring. Thanks. Okay, um, so I, I'll I'm going to leave leave you for for now, but um, again, thank you, and I'll be in touch with you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you right. so much. Thank you, right. Chinwei. Nice to meet Bye. you. Bye. Bye, Bye. everyone. Bye.